So, um, so let's start. Um, my name is Lin Zhao. I'm from Axon Mobile, and welcome to our Axon Mobile uh, ISP Response and Knowledge Transfer webinar. So, uh, so many of you have joined this webinar already. So, I'm not going to uh, go through the details of the uh, both and not of the webinar. Uh, two things I want to mention is that um, we are going to record this uh, uh, webinar both. Uh, uh, by means of audio and video. So if you have a, a rejection, etc., just let me know. And, and also uh, for the webinar, Roger, uh, our uh, today's guest speaker will have uh, one hour-ish to talk. And then uh, we'll go through the questions uh, at the end. And the ad attendees can only uh, submit their questions uh, through Q&A button. Uh, I'm sure you can see all the questions. And then uh, at the end, we'll, uh, Roger and I will go through all the questions. And while as Roger is talking, you can start to populate the questions uh, as well. Uh, so our today's uh, guest speaker is Dr. Roger Prince. Uh, Roger was a senior research associate with ExxonMobil uh, Biomedical Science Inc. in uh, New Jersey, our Clinton office uh, until 2016. He was Exxon's lead scientist in the monitoring of the successful bioremediation of the 1989 uh, Exxon Valdez spill and uh, also did the field work on experimental spills in the Arctic. So I wasn't uh, with the Exxon Mobil very long. So uh, Roger was um, before my time when he worked for Exxon Mobil. But uh, I have the privilege to work with him since I joined the Exxon Mobil, and I all, all, always amazed by his uh, sharp and critical thinking on research and always trying to seek wisdom from him for different projects. So prior to joining ExxonMobil, Roger was a visiting faculty member at the University of California in Berkeley and on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he, uh, he has uh, published more than 370 papers and chapters in the referred literature and was awarded the Stanford uh, Barrel W. Lytle Prize for contributions to synchrotron spectroscopy in 2000, the North Jersey ACS North Jersey Chapters Lifetime Achievement Award in 2007, and the uh, Walkman uh, Honorary Lectureship of the Theobald Smith uh, Society in 2013. Without further ado, uh, I will give the floor to Roger. Good morning and thank you for your <laughs> generous comments. Um, I am keen today to talk about dispersants and why they're so uh, important and mainly to uh, address what is often said, which is, well, they're toxic and there's all these bad things that dispersants do. And so my comment, next, next slide, please. My talk is basically based on what Mr. Churchill said about democracy, which is that it's not that wonderful, but it's much better than everything else. And that's really how I view dispersants here. There are certainly issues with dispersants, not least in how to apply them. They're, it's not trivial to apply dispersants. And that literature is not a, it's not a scientific literature. I don't know a great deal about the engineering that's gone on and the pumps and the nozzles and things. But that, so there are certainly challenges with dispersants. But compared to all the other things we can do, they're much better. And it's not that, again, you know, no one pretends that democracy is perfect. And this, the same is true with dispersants, but they're usually the best option. Next slide, please. The problem with oil spills really began after the Second World War. And this was a bit of a surprise to me because I, you know, I'm an old geezer, right? I grew up in the 50s and I saw TV and movies about World War II and aircraft carriers and planes and tanks and all that sort of stuff. 
And I imagined, you know, that it was just like it is today. But you can see from that graph along the bottom there, on the right there, that during the Second World War, the amount of oil that was used was tiny, that oil was not a big deal. So even though tankers were sunk, the amount of oil in any one incident was not particularly egregious. And it wasn't really thought to be a big deal. It was only after the Second World War in the 50s and then into the 60s and 70s when the world began to use oil on this staggering scale that we use it today. And in order to use the oil, of course, one of the you know, sod's law issues, of course, is that the oil isn't where people want to burn it. So it has to be transported. And um, a vast amount of it gets transported by sea. And you can see there on the left, the change in, in size, a typical World War II tanker was just 90,000 barrels. Today, the big ones are 3 million barrels. Next slide, please. So the first big spill occurred off the coast of Britain, just as I was on my way off to university. It was the Torrey Canyon. It had been built in 1959, but then because of this tremendous increase in need for transportation of oil, it had been doubled in size in 1965. So it was a fairly new vessel, right? The spill occurred in 67. And you can see there that map of the top of France and the bottom of Britain, that uh, it went aground on the seven stones. Now, this is one of these, uh, some of the take home lessons from this talk are almost, they're, they're almost unbelievable, right? Usually they're fairly recently, fairly new vessels. And most of the spills occurred by sheer bloody mindedness. I mean, in the seven stones, Rocks are well known. They are, they don't move. They've been on charts for hundreds of years. And yet somehow this ship managed to hit them. Anyway, it got stuck on there. And eventually you can see where the oiling occurred, mainly on Cornwall and Brittany. Next slide, please. Here it is first sitting on the, uh, on the reef and the Royal Navy helicopters coming out to have a look. And at this stage, it looks pretty good. And they did indeed get uh, some salvage guys onto the vessel to have a look and see what they might do. But uh, they decided they couldn't get it off. And tragically, one guy was actually killed uh, during the um, surveying for the salvage vessel. So they didn't know what to do, but as you can see on the next day, oil was just pouring out of it. And uh, most of the pictures are gonna be in black and white. Many of them are black and white. This is the early days of uh, color videography. Next slide, please. Big storm soon broke up the ship and by the ninth, the ship had broken in two, uh, really in two, by the ninth day. Next slide, please. So what you gonna do? Well, <laughs> I chuckle just because it's so wonderfully witless in view of what we know today. They brought in the RAF and the RAF bombed it with these planes known as Blackburn Buccaneers. This was the last of the British independent aerospace industry. And they, the first thing they did was drop 42 1,000 pound bombs on it. Part of the embarrassment apparently was, although the ship was very clearly not moving, they still, several of them missed. But eventually they used 161 bombs, 16 rockets, napalm, and 40,000 litres of kerosene in an attempt to set this ship on fire. And they did burn some, as you can see, they made a horrible mess, but fundamentally no one thinks they burnt more than one or 2% of the cargo. Next one, please. And I'll, I'll just br briefly mention this later. I, I think I've got slides. The new Carissa in 1999, in that case, the Marines had a go at, US Marines had a go at trying to set fire to a ship with oil in it, and they also failed. And so after they burnt it, it was still on the rocks and it just now looked very ugly. Next one, please. So this is the effect. I'm always suspicious of some of these pictures that are saved in the archives, because these people are far too clean to have been working very long on the oil. But nonetheless, all the oil essentially, well, a large fraction of the oil beached and they, there were no plans to do anything about it. And so everybody showed up and tried to clean up. And uh, you can see the scale, right? They're putting it in the muck buckets here. Next slide. Children got involved. Lots of people standing around there with shovels. I, I, I have a farm now and I do a lot of work with shovels and I have a lot of sympathy for photographs of people standing, getting a breather with shovels because it's bloody hard work using shovels. But the picture at the bottom is the one that most makes me chuckle because it's so wonderfully English. These are people using watering cans to apply detergent to the oil. 
I think it's just beyond belief. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the response. But once they'd tried all that sort of stuff, the oil was still left on the beaches. Next, short. Next slide, please. So they tried other things, and the chemical industry recommended all sorts of products, none of which seemed to be particularly uh, effective. You see all the barrels there waiting for the guy to use them. It was called oil spill remover. And the answer is no, it didn't. Uh, but they tried a lot of that. It's not supposed to be a dispersant. You know, it is just a, a detergent and a strong solvent. Next one, please. They tried flamethrowers. They tried napalm. They tried everything. And they burnt some. But again, it's really hard, as we're going to learn, as we know, you have to get the oil quite thick and stop it cooling down for it to be able to burn. And let me just point out, these pictures come from uh, Pathé uh, videos. They're all available on the web. I've put my email address on every slide. So you may think now, oh, I don't care. But if you ever get to where you think, gosh, I'd like to have, know a bit more about that, please uh, do feel free to email me and I'll send you what I know, including links to the videos if you want them. And I have published a paper recently. You'll find it easily with Google Scholar. It's in international biodeterioration and biodegradation, actually with a year, next year, but it's already available. And I'll be happy to send people copies, which gives, again, links to various uh, videos about all the spills I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. That was napalm. These now are, and flamethrowers, these are now flares that were set off to burn it. And you can see that, again, they, they did try hard. Next one, please. And it did get to France. And you know, here you see some young Frenchmen having a go at trying to clean up the oil. But the other thing I want you to note here is not only are all these people exposed to the oil, but look how close these lovely houses are, right? This is, most of the world has people living close to most shorelines. So there's gonna be tremendous human exposure if we let oil get to shorelines. And so it's really not a good idea to let oil get to shorelines. Next one, please. So all in all, it was a complete comedy of errors, right? It was a well-equipped vessel. It hit a well-marked reef and there's no real explanation for it. There are several books, but there's no explanation. There were no spill response plans. There was no lightering, although a salvage crew did get on the ship, one man died. They did try all sorts of detergents and solvents, but there were no application tools, as you saw, apart from watering cans. There was an enormous public response to shoreline cleanup, so enormous numbers of people got involved. There was minimal industrial hygiene supervision. Minimal is a generous word there, I think. Local innovation took over. Fishing vessels tried to apply detergents. Locals and the military tried all sorts of stuff. The total amount of chemicals, you know, in a DOR, as we in the trade like to mention, was probably almost one to one. They poured so much junk on the beach. And they tried flamethrowers and other ignition devices. The one thing that can be said that was good about it is it led to the founding of ITOP. And I'm pleased to know that ITOP now don't call themselves the, the Tank Owners Pollution Federation, because that sounded awfully like they were in favor of it. Now they just call themselves ITOP. Next one, please. There was only one significant paper on the environmental impact by the Southwoods, uh, the Marine Biological Association, but note the bloody title, Recolonization of Rocky Shores in Cornwall after use of toxic dispersants. Well, the first thing I'd say is, you know, we can haggle over toxic. Uh, they weren't dispersants. They were not, they were detergents and things, but they were not designed to, they, they were designed to clean. You would, I wouldn't call dawn washing up liquid a dispersant. It's a washing up liquid, right? It, it is going to disperse, but that's, it's to get the oil off things. It's, it's not really to get the oil in, into the water so much as to get the oil off your plates. And so the dispersants we use today have nothing in common with the chemicals that were used for the Torrey Canyon. But notice the, this is the abstract. I was rude when I gave this talk in Canada and said it's a relatively obscure journal, the Journal of Fisheries Research Board of Canada. But nonetheless, it's very well cited. And here's the problem, slightly yellowed at the bottom, five to eight years, to nine to 10 years, and one rare hermit crab is still missing. You know, it, you get, I love it. Next one, please. Anyway, the take home message was that these black tides that showed up both in England and France led it, 
it became clear to people it would be much better not to let the oil get to shore. And so all major companies began research on dispersants. If you search the patent literature, there are hundreds of patents on all aspects of trying to stop oil getting to shorelines. And many companies um, developed dispersants. And these were designed now to get the oil when it's at sea and disperse it into tiny droplets into the water. And none of them, very few of these people were stupid, right? They, they used uh, ingredients that were generally regarded as safe. Now, in fact, the, the regulations that about grass are not quite, were not well developed back in the uh, 60s and 70s. They are well developed now. But these are the compounds that you can use around food or you can add to food. As we'll see, the surfactants that are used in Corexits are allowed to be used in food. They are used in uh, faux creams in pastries. But the solvent, for example, is allowed to be used as a lubricant for machinery that's moving food. You know, it's all well and good to think about grinding up meat or mincing meat. But you, of course, those machines need lubrication and they get lubrication. And so they use lubricants that pass the tests about what they can and can't contain. For example, they're usually white oils with no aromatics in them. Anyway, Jerry Canaveri led Exxon's effort. He's the guy who I think invented the word Corexit, which I think is a nice name, although back in the 70s, it, it sounded like a typing correction fluid. But I'm sure half the audience won't even know what typing correction fluid is anymore. The key thing he discovered was that the it was the effect, it was the, the balance of the hydrophilic lipophilic nature of the surfactants that was key and that they knew they were going to have to mix surfactants. They mixed anionic and neutral uh, non-ionic uh, surfactants to get the mixtures that were the corexits. And basically they mainly used the spans and the tweens. Um, these are, they, they're based on the sorbitan nucleus, which is basically a fully hydroxylated hexo sugar and the, or you could call it an alcohol. It's somewhat polar, and then they bolt onto it uh, long-tailed fatty acids, typically oleic acid you know, from olive oil. But the key patent is this patent from 1974. Next slide, please. And they were first used in 1968 for the SOSM built in 1960, which and that was a spill at the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, where it hit a rock. Where it shouldn't, have, where neither the ship nor the rock should have been, but it's a bit. It's actually this ship is one of those corollary damages. This, this wreck. It wasn't a wreck. It was a, a leak that the ship was salvaged and carried on for many years. Um, the ship was only there because the Suez Canal was closed because of the uh, Arab-Israeli War, the Six Day War, when they closed the Suez Canal for a long time. So again, it's, it's amazing the corollaries of things that, 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 that enter into our industry. So this is the first time the Corexits were used. Next one, please. And they developed all sorts of formulations. And there's a picture of Jerry. Uh, he died a few years ago, but uh, he carried on working uh, as a consultant uh, for a long time after his retirement. And all of the products were made. I mean, he, he wasn't just doing it entirely at random, but his, his fundamental method was to mix dropwise, keeping good records, and seeing what was the most effective mixture of surfactants and solvent. And many, one of the things that was said about uh, dispersants with the Deepwater Horizon spill was, well, oh, it's just this product you've had around for ages. Well, that's sort of true, right? Just like say Tide washing powder has been around for ages, but they really have tweaked the formula to try and make it as good as possible. And these are just the ones that have been published in the literature. They don't tell you the recipe, but at least Jerry thought they were different enough to give them different numbers. As you know, we've uh, focused on 9500 as the major one we used to do. And all of these were made from compounds that are generally regarded as safe. Nevertheless, the mantra of toxic dispersants had really taken root. Next one, please. So when the Amacoca Diz spill occurred off Brittany in 1978, the French were reluctant to use dispersants. They had some around and they did use some. This is the only spill of this group uh, that I'm going to mention here where it was uh, a design flaw in the ship. In this case, it was a mother of a storm 
and a huge rogue wave hit the rudder and broke the hydraulics and there were no backup. So the ship had, its engine was still fine, but it had no rudder and it was an extreme storm. And although tugs got out close to it, they couldn't uh, tow it in the weather and eventually it grounded. But this is, of all the spills, all the other ones seem basically to be human error, which is a sobering thought. And despite it being called the Amacoca Diz, the oil belonged to Shell. Next one, please. So here it is in finer days. There's day two after it that was rot wrecked, and then eventually it sank like that. I think that proboscis on the bow makes it look rather like a shark looking grumpy, and there's a better picture in a day or two, in a slide or two. Next one, please. And again, it lost its whole ca cargo fairly close to shore, and this is what happened, right? There's oil everywhere. And again, it's right next to people's houses. Right? You can imagine how lovely it would be to live here, except on the days after the Amacoca did the spill. I mean, that's oil all over the place, right? The human exposure to vapors and things is just terrible. And the oil sits there for quite a while. Next one, please. Here's an aerial picture of a different bit, not quite so many houses here, but still plenty of houses close to the thing. And there are people, I think, clearing up there. Next one, please. And yet another picture. This again is fully authentic in my experience of oil spills. These guys look appropriately dirty. Next one, please. They use no significant amount of dispersants. This is the one that is the most uh, loomingly ominous photograph, don't you think? That shark-like beast there. Um, they did use small amounts of dispersants from, a, um, from boats and from a helicopter, but they limited the amount they used because of concerns over toxicity, their words. They tried powdered chalk as a sinking agent. That wouldn't be allowed in the in US regulations. Um, and the French Navy destroyed this vessel with depth charges dropped by helicopters. This time, the helicopters obviously had plenty of time to drop their depth charges. They all hit the vessel, but one or two of them didn't explode. So no divers were allowed to, to visit the site for many years. And when they were eventually allowed to go down there, the bow section had disappeared completely. No one knows where it is. And you can see the size of it, it's not a tiny thing. No shoreline detergents were used, but I will say a key part of this issue, this oil really formed dreadful mousses, really like chocolate mousse that you might hope to get as part of your pudding. And they used demulsifying agents. They were essential to be able to pump the oil that was collected. Next one, please. And again, there was only one paper seriously about the environmental impacts, and it uses almost the same words as the Sutherland one, right? It's just amazing. But of course, there were no dispersants used here, right? But there isn't toxic in the, in the title this time. I, I should have included the title, shouldn't I? But it's the same sort of stuff, right? Five to 10 years, up to 60 years. And it's all true. I mean, these numbers have some validity to them. It's not complete mumbo jumbo. Although I think it's important I'm going to take a slight detour into how stable the environment is. Next one, please. This is uh, Alan Mearns. Many of you know Alan, uh, a Noah guy standing next to, I think, his rock in Prince William Sound. In the early days after the Prince William Sound, after the Exxon Valdez spill in Prince William Sound, where lots of heroic, we'll get, get to it later, lots of heroic things have been used to try and clean up the beaches. People were concerned that the warm water used was about the temperature of coffee or the vigorous nature of the hoses compared to a storm, they were nothing, but nonetheless, that you were doing this irreparable damage to shorelines, in my opinion, and you know I have no humble ones, it's nonsense. But here's an example. Alan went back and then he got other guys to do it and different people went back over the years and they took photographs of the same rock at the same time of year every year until, well, they're still doing it, I believe. Here's a picture, a poster from a oil spill conference a couple of years ago. And you can see how the rockweed and the mussels sort of alternate. Um, there's, this is just natural as far as we can see. And the next slide, please. And this is, <laughs> I believe they called it Ernie because of Sesame Street, but I'm not sure. Alan does have an interestingly gentle sense of humor. But here's another rock, and you can see from the right-hand side there where it's put into some sort of data, just how the um, different things 
uh, have um, have varied over the year. That's muscle cover. Sometimes it's essentially 100% of the, of the rock is covered by muscles. Other time there isn't a single one to be found. And as far as we know, this is going on throughout the sound. As far as we know, th this has been going on forever and will go on forever. So it's not clear when these, when the Southwards and the Conans made their statement about five years, that I'm not suggesting they were malevolent, but I am suggesting that they didn't know what they were talking about. Next one, please. And just as another aside, what on earth was the point of sinking the vessels? I mean, they tried all those bombs, they tried all those death charges, and after all, we all know that oil floats, so it's not at all a good, uh, clear to me why you'd want to sink a ship full of oil. It's just going to be there forever and you're going to have to come back and pick it up at some stage. It's bound to be more expensive. The only ship that seems to have really taken care of itself by fire was the, uh, the Haven off Genoa in 1991. And that one killed six crewmen in a major explosion. In this case, the oil started burning when it was still inside the ship. Uh, to deliberately ignite spilled oil requires collecting in a boom and the use or the use of herders. Next one, please. This is just an aside about the Haven spill, but you can see, A, it's, it's of interest to some of us that it actually was once the Amoco Milford Haven, a sister ship of the Amoco Cadiz, and it got sold and moved on. Various people owned it. And it was bringing oil from Iran to Genoa. In this case, it exploded as they, when the ship was about half empty and the, the fire really got going, and they think that more than 70% of the oil that was in the ship when it happened uh, burned. Um, and then some of the burned residue was now very dense and did sink. Next one, please. So, because people think oil burns, when the new Carissa occurred in 1999, they, um, this was actually, a, it's not an oil tanker, it was a cargo ship that wanted to take wood chips from the, uh, I think from Oregon, it might have been from the southern part of Washington state. It was going to take them to Japan. It was waiting for the weather to subside so it could go and pick up the wood chips. It was essentially empty, but it had its fuel and it got stuck on the beach. And they tried to drag it off, but they couldn't. It broke in two. And so again, smart people thought that the best thing to do would be to uh, use napalm and explosives. And they did set fire to it and bought, uh, removed hardly any of the oil. Eventually, they, um, the bow was towed offshore, and you think at this stage it would want to sink, right? But they tried seven, well, they first tried plastic explosives, then they tried 70 naval shells, and finally a submarine launched torpedo to sink the, the bow section, and the stern was removed by uh, salvers off the shoreline. But that, that is another example of how setting fire to a ship is by no means simple. So it didn't work with Amoco Cadiz, it didn't work with Torrey Canyon, and it didn't work with the new Carissa. So I think we should remember that setting fire to a ship is much more difficult than you might hope. Next one, please. So back to dispersants, which is really my license here, right? This to me is a very key experiment. This is the Baffin Island oil spill experiment, often shortened to BIOS, to those in the trade. It was funded by Canada. It was a several year project in Baffin Island. So the inset map there on the left shows you just how far north Baffin Island is. It's way above the Arctic Circle. And then the, um, the, the major map on the left shows you the top of Baffin Island. And that town of Pond Inlet, there's open water there for two or three months a year. The rest of the year it's frozen solid. And they do bring in uh, supplies with the ship and the ship is accompanied by an icebreaker just in case. But there is daily, essentially daily, air service to it. And the supermarket, when I went up there, had strawberries. The um, actual oil spill project is quite a hike from Pond Inlet. It, we had a helicopter. It needs a helicopter or a small plane. Anyway, they did lots of experiments. There, there were about uh, 40 people staying there at, at, at the peak, doing all sorts of experiments. They did lots of shoreline experiments of different things in that thing there on the right called the Zed Lagoon. But um, I want to talk about the two uh, uh, oil bays on the left-hand side of the right-hand map, uh, where Bay 11, it was called, and Bay 9. And in those places, they uh, released oil offshore and let it drift onto the shore and watched what happens. And they did it with oil or with um, dispersed oil. Next slide, please. 
So here's the picture of his pictures of the oiled slick, the oil slick without dispersant. They had a pipe that pumped the oil from the shore out with the pump. And you can see it being released on the left. They had a boom to you know, keep some eye on it. And then they, it landed on the shoreline. And then you can see at lower tide, an awful lot on the right. There's an awful lot of oil stuck to the intertidal zone. Next slide, please. There's, I think that's Gary Sergi taking a photograph of the, uh, uh, of the photographer. But you can see there is oil everywhere. Very, we're going to see that again with the Exxon Valdez. The point about here is they did skim. They had a skimmer there. They skimmed some of the residual oil. Um, they thought it was sort of stable after 48 hours. And they think that 82% of the oil remained on the shoreline. And I will say, I went there 20 years later. It didn't look like that, but as soon as you paid attention, there was plenty of oil to be found on the shoreline. And some of it was essentially uh, the same as when it had been spilled, except it had lost everything smaller than C15. But all the financiers were there, all the crises were there, the large alkanes were still all there. And this was published long ago. That was the beach where they put bare naked oil on the beach. Next slide, please. Here's the other beach where they, in this case, they pumped dispersed oil. Now they did cheat. They did use, they did pre-mix the oil and the dispersant. And you can see the radically different color. This, this is the classic cafe au lait of dispersed oil, right? The oil is still brown and black, but it's in the water. There's so much light scattering that it now takes on the appearance of brown coffee, uh, of milky coffee, cafe au lait. And in this case, the oil went on the shoreline. They had big guys sampling and everything. You see the boats around. They did all sorts of things. And it all washed off again with the outgoing tide. No oil stuck to the shore. I say no. The highest they measured was 16 ppm, right? That's 16 milligrams per kilogram. Essentially none. So the oil did not stick because it was dispersed. Now, of course, therefore, it was in the water. So they did lots of measurements in the water. And you can see there some of the numbers. Again, this is all published in uh, a, a supplement to the journal Arctic. Again, if, if you email me, I'll happily send you the citations, or you can look up my um, paper in theory in 2023, that uh, there's good references to all these papers there. The, um, the, the amount of oil in the, in the shoreline was minimal. The amount of oil in the water was very dilute. Next slide, please. Now there were environmental impacts, right? The, this is really the, you know, the decently high Arctic. There's almost nothing in the intertidal. It's so bleak there in the winter. But when you get to the subtidal, there's plenty of, of beasties and algae. And uh, there were effects. And in particular, they did see narcosis within 24 hours of release. Um, and the re but recovery was observed during the next two weeks. One of the interesting things, is, in my opinion, was the um, the fact that animal uptake was greater a kilometer from the release to the ones closest, presumably because the ones closest didn't take it up because they bolted for, they went as far down in their burrows as they possibly could. On the other hand, some of them, there was a bit there, including emergence from the substrate, presumably to shout and be grumpy about it, right? But the point is there were no long lived effects. The vast majority of these organisms that they measured recovered within a couple of weeks. The dispersed was taken up by things, but it was depurated. The, the metabolism handled it. Next slide, please. Now, I want, this is my, uh, my expertise is in oil biodegradation. And I, it's really important to understand that the oil is dispersed and it is diluted. But that isn't the reason why this is such a great technique. The reason why this is such an environmentally responsible thing to do is that once the oil is in small droplets, it gets biodegraded rapidly. This is an experiment where the left hand set of uh, GC traces is oil floating as a slick and very compared to dispersed oil when it's completely in the water column. Those uh, tall peaks that are in the traces are the individual N alkanes and that unresolved hump is all the other sort of stuff. I'll come to that in a second. But you can see the difference between having the oil as a slick or having the oil with dispersant. There's the same amount of oil in both bottles in this case. And again, I'd be happy to send you 
chapter and verse. But you can see that in this case, this is actually in, at room temperature in, with New Jersey seawater, but we lost half the oil by seven days and we'd lost 84% by 40 days. So the half-life is in the, of the order of seven to 14 days here, right? So the oil is dispersed, it becomes tiny droplets, and it is then biodegraded. So it really does leave the environment. My guess is that half of it goes to biomass, half to CO2 and water, and then something comes along and eats that biomass, and half of it goes to biomass of the grazer, and eventually you end up with more fish, although not a lot more fish because there's been so many trophic levels. Next slide, please. And just another aside here about how complicated oil really is. Most oils are about 30% linear and branched saturated, essentially alkanes, about 30% cyclic saturated things. So these are the big brothers of cyclohexane, the big brothers of decalin, many of these with uh, straight chain substituents, and about 30% aromatics. Most of those multi-ring and most of those with alkyl substituents. And there's about 10% polar compounds, which are unamenable to gas chromatography, which we don't see. The point about the trace on the right, that chromatogram, is that's an example of a two-dimensional GC analysis. The first dimension along the bottom there is essentially separating by boiling point. The column gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and so things move. It takes a long time for the C30s to come out, but eventually they come out. But in this particular case, rather than going straight to a detector, every uh, 20 seconds worth of output goes to a second column and is then uh, squirted out through that column, which separates based on polarity. This is not massive polarity with charge. It's the difference between aromatics and saturates, for example. They're difference in polarity. And the point is it separates the oil into these many classes. I like to tease that there won't be a test, it's all right. I'd like you to notice the one, the circle labeled H though, because that's where the hopanes come out. And I'm gonna just show you briefly that the hopanes are very recalcitrant, so we can use them as an internal marker for the oil. Next slide, please. I just want to, another aside here, just be very aware that when people talk about TPAH for total PAHs, they are using a most bizarre use of the word total. They mean some of the very few I'm bothering to measure. And so typically the quote TPAH of an oil is less than 1% of its total volume, even though we know that 30% of the oil is actually aromatic. Different techniques see different things. Again, I'd be happy to talk at length offline about this. Next slide, please. But here's the key for us here. And that is that there's the initial oil at the top. In that case, this is an initial oil that had a bit of, uh, had to correct it with it. And after 60 days, here's what's left. And if you remember that circle, which I had labeled H, that's what's left, right? There are a few other molecules there. But it, it, this is routine that we see 80 to 90% of the hydrocarbons we can detect get consumed by microbes. This, of course, is primary degradation. They, they've uh, disappeared. They're no longer hydrocarbons. But we, we expect that they've gone all the way to biomass, CO2, and water. So dispersion is not just diluting it and letting dilution be the solution. Dispersion is dilution, and that dilution so increases the surface area that the microbes now have the ability to attach to it and degrade it rapidly. Next slide, please. Now, another grumpy thing about this, about this issue about dispersants being toxic. Of course, it's true that all things are toxic. It's the dose that counts. One of the things that, first of all, there's this wonderful picture of Paracelsus with his hair. And I do think I am grateful that the good Lord has left my hair not looking like that. But the second thing to say is that he recognized that it's to do with the dose and the time of the dose. And that's true today as it was back then. It's really important to recognize that a bottle of whiskey is the LD50 for an average woman. And a bit more than a bottle is the LD50 for a bloke, because blokes are heavier. The mechanism of death from that LD50 is nothing to do 
with the beatific smile you get from the one or two small glasses you drink, perhaps with a little bit of water as you sit in front of the fire. There's no correlation between the beautiful effects of a small amount and the awful effects of the large amount. Quite different biochemical mechanisms. Same is true for aspirin. Two or three aspirin will help fix your headache. If you take the bottle, it will fix your headache, but you will not be worrying about much else. The way that kills you is unrelated to the beatific effects of taking small amounts, a small dose, and hoping your headache goes away. So toxicity is, is tricky stuff. It's, it's very good that we know about the toxicity of things. It's very good we know that you shouldn't drink a bottle of scotch. And you know, every year in America, we have these awful occasions when uh, beginning undergraduates are hazed and drink a bottle of spirits. And of course, some percentage of them do indeed die, it being the LD50. But that's got nothing to do with the pleasure that most of us get from a glass of scotch. So the question when it comes to oil is, what is the effective exposure to oil and to dispersants? Clearly, the initial concentration of dispersed oil is very high. I mean, you can pick your number, right? At some level, the droplet is just coming off the, the slick or just coming off the plume. And it must, it's, it's mainly oil, you know, it's half oil or something. But rapidly, it dilutes away there. And it drops to the sub PPM level in hours. And I'm going to show you some data in the next page. And very few experiments assessing toxicity have found effects at such levels. And the other thing to say, just another statement about toxicity, well, what about the chronic effects? Well, there may be chronic effects, but I've already told you that the oil doesn't sit around long enough, if it's dispersed, to have chronic effects. The microbes consume it so fast that chronic effects are essentially irrelevant here. Grumpiness. In particular, though, this is a, a, just a statement that needs to be re reminded, people need to be reminded, Corexits are about as toxic as Dawn washing up liquid. Dawn is so proud of the fact that it's used for cleaning oil ducklings that it's on the label of the bottle. And nobody worries about the toxicity of the bottle of washing up liquid by the side of their kitchen sink. And indeed, they shouldn't worry about the toxicity of it because it's a moot point. Grumpy old man. Next slide, please. Here's what I think is the most important paper that came out of the Deepwater Horizon. And it's, it's not mine. It's uh, the best bets of the measurements of dispersed oil after dispersion from a variety of papers. You'll have to go and, you know, a variety of sources. But this is the best data that's available, and there isn't much of it, about the level of oil under a dispersed plume. And you can see how quickly the oil drops to very low levels. And notice the time scale. I, I mean, I would say that that means it's dropped to the very few ppm within 100 minutes, right? A couple of hours. And note that time scale, right? It's minutes, not hours. Yet toxicity tests are typically, the ones that Embassy does, are 96-hour tests, right? I've done the little sum for you there, right? That's 5,760 minutes, or 23 times longer than this axis. So when you do an experiment, say, oh, the LD50 is, say, 10 ppm, well, okay, fair enough. We're not at 10 ppm, right? We're at very much lower. And you can imagine, there's no reason to believe it stays, you know, it, it's not diluting by diffusion, carrying on. So the real issue about uh, toxic dispersants is a complete canard from start to finish. Toxic dispersants are not significantly toxic. And you hear people say this occasionally, but my strong opinion is that we ought to mandate, demand that the oil spill toxicologists, when they talk about whatever LD50s or l C-50s or LE-50s they talk about, they have to, should have to add, but we never see that in the real world, and then cite this paper, because nobody detects bad things happening at the 1 ppm level. Next slide, please. But back to oil spills. And then again, now we're back to the question, it's not a design flaw, it's just sheer bloody mindedness on the part of people who do know better. The Exxon Valdez was again, a relatively new ship, nice big one. It was en route from California to Valdez. It went backwards and forwards. Valdez is at the Southern part of the big part of Alaska. And it was chosen because it's the 
um, southernmost, sorry, northernmost ice-free port. Here comes a little joke. It's ice-free in the sense of, of ice hockey. It is not ice-free in the sense of gin and tonics. And there is this large Columbia Glacier, which actually now has retreated actually off this map. But uh, in 1989, the ice came down to about where that island is and uh, the icebergs carve off it. They go out into the shipping channel there. You can see that there's a shipping lane. It's actually got something, the equivalent of air traffic control, at least in theory. The ships stay in the lane. They ask for permission to leave it for different reasons. They do or don't get permission to leave. So the Valdez asked for permission to leave the uh, channel and forgot to ever turn back into the channel and it ended up where that star is, which was the um, Bly Reef. And Bly Reef is 36 feet underwater. But the trouble is the Exxon Valdez drew 38 feet. Next slide, please. On the bright side, because it was stuck on that reef, it didn't lose much of its cargo. It, we seem to, they seem to have offloaded about 80% was offloaded by lightering into smaller tankers that didn't draw 34 feet, uh, 38 feet, so they could uh, sidle up next to it and offload the oil. And the picture on the right is when they'd sailed the Exxon Valdez down to San Francisco, where it had been built, and that's the hole in the bottom. I think it's quite amazing it could sail down to San Diego with that hole in the bottom, and there they fixed it. And it went on to have a somewhat checkered career under various other names. Next slide, please. Well, they did try dispersants, and the picture on the right is claimed to be a photograph of spraying dispersant over the uh, slick when it first occurred. I'm somewhat suspicious, but I, anyway, we'll take it on faith. They certainly did run one plane worth of dispersant over it, and then they tried, I believe, two bucket loads from a helicopter. And certainly the bucket loads, that photograph is a later picture, not, certainly was not. Early. But the problem was that it was a flat calm essentially and nothing happened when they added the dispersant. So they said, no more, stop it. Now, in, I think in all honesty, we have to say they didn't have much more dispersant. It would have been very hard to disperse it because they just didn't have access to the dispersant. The stuff up in Valdez was under 30 feet of snow, um, which is again, there are things which are just sheer bloody minded. You can't imagine that people let this happen, but they do. Next slide, please. So this is what NOAA calculated. Another grumpy thing coming up here. This is the NOAA uh, HAZMAT trajectory model, and it's from day one and day six. And they are doing it there. You can see the, the uh, units, there's 53 particles per square mile. Well, I think I know what a particle is, but then you read down and you discover each particle represents 1,100 gallons of oil or 20, 55 gallon drums. What? Well, how dare you use particle for that? I mean, it's just, it's my language. How dare you? Anyway, you see the effect there on the day one, the oil was sitting in a nice pancake with the ship in the middle of it in a flat calm. Nothing much was done. And then a mother of a storm, a really big storm came through and the oil went down and it smeared all those shorelines of the major islands in Prince William Sound. Prince William Sound, of course, is a, it, it was named by that back in the great days of British exploration. And the names of the islands are, of course, I think I shall call this Night Island. Hold on, we call it, shut up, we're going to call it Night Island. You know, this is, there, there were people living there, there still are people living in this area, but um, all the names, I regret to say, are ours. Anyway, the oil went down, smeared all the shorelines, and these are pictures, yes, please, next slide. Uh, these are pictures, you know, I mean, <laughs> there was oil everywhere. I was out there quite a bit. I was very involved with the bioremediation. The picture in the top middle allows me to tell you another little joke. And this is the major way the shorelines were cleared, cleaned, right? There was oil stuck to the rocks. So they set up a header hose. They pumped seawater out of the sound. And it, you can see it there in approximately the horizontal middle water just uh, being pumped in a deluge onto the shoreline. And then other pipes uh, and pumps are being used to uh, give the workers hoses and the hoses are being used to dislodge the oil into that flowing deluge to get the oil back down into the water where it's collected with skimmers. And there's another good picture there on the left of the way that's working, bottom left. 
The joke, though, is that in that top picture, the orange line, all the people promised to stay south of that line in the hope the bears would reciprocate and not go cross over it. And indeed, there was a lot of worry that bears would come down and uh, feast on workers for a bit. But uh, in fact, no bears were seen, so that soon stopped being a worry. But again, even in a remote place, right, where you could say, well, at least there's no human exposure. Well, we thoughtfully brought along several thousand people to get exposed. Oil on a shoreline is just an awful thing. Another thing that may make you chuckle, but also ought to make you weep, is that the picture in the bottom middle is an Egmapole, a French Egmapole skimmer. It's a polyethylene belt that goes up there. You can see it. And then there's a knife edge that scrapes the oil off as it goes over the top and you collect the oil. But as I just said, it's French. Actually, in this picture you can see also it's only just arrived. Look how clean it is. But um, because it's French, it didn't fit in with the Jones Act, which says that vessels involved in interstate commerce must be made and uh, crewed by Americans. And so they were never allowed to turn the engines on, you know, the propelling engines. They always had to tow these around, even though they could have put putted from shoreline to shoreline. They weren't allowed to because of the Jones Act. And there was oil everywhere. It's not quite obvious in that picture, bottom right, but that little inflatable is sitting in a boom where the oil is perhaps two inches thick, right? That's been washed off shorelines and a skimmer's going to come and scarf it up. Next slide, please. And aside, after that washing had been done, and in places where the oil wasn't particularly uh, dramatic, uh, the response tool was to put down fertilizers. And as you can see, this picture on the left, those there's three people in the bottom left there, right? One of them is uh, Dave Kennedy, who's six foot four or so, big guy. And that picture is taken two weeks after uh, Inipol was sprayed. Inipol is a microemulsion of oleic acid in olive oil, in oleic acid, I should say. A microemulsion of urea in oleic acid. And uh, it was sprayed on there and the microbes got to work and they cleaned the shoreline. Uh, and that was so, so successful that bioremediation was a major part of the cleanup um, and eventually seven mile, 70 miles of shoreline were treated with fertilizer. But look at the number of people, 10,000 workers, a thousand vessels, 100 aircraft, it goes on and on, right? And jolly expensive. Now, dispersants are expensive, but you wouldn't have had all that human exposure if you'd used dispersants. Next one, please. And the oil left the sound, what it didn't beach, and it went all the way down and was, you know, the sun was found way south of Kodiak. It wasn't a continuous slick, of course, but there were great big dollops of oil meandering, you know, this, that's 470 miles, right? It was clearly oiled from the Exxon Valdez, was found as floating lumps uh, almost 500 miles away from the spill. And they think that 60% of the oil beach, 20% evaporated and 20% dispersed. Next slide, please. So I just want to remind you that dispersants were essentially not used in those spills. And despite the, that's despite the enormous amount of work demonstrating efficacy. Well, perhaps I didn't say it, I should have said it. And that is that after the Valdez, lots of experiments were done. And one experiment, for example, was done at Omset, the big tank in New Jersey, where a slick was put out on the tank and dispersant was applied and it was just left there sitting. And then the waves were turned on after six days and the oil happily dispersed. So if they had sprayed dispersant um, on the slick in the flat calm of uh, Prince William Sound, there's every reason to believe that the oil would have dispersed when that mother of a storm showed up, which it did four days later, and that it would have dispersed when the waves appeared, and then it would not have stuck to the shorelines. Anyway, to return to the issue, the fundamental issue has always been that, that people think they're toxic. And so all of those experiments contaminated shorelines, and yet we know that the Baffin Island experiments show that dispersed oil does not adhere to shorelines. And subsequent trials in Long Cove, Maine, and on mangroves in Panama showed similar results. And that's the, the second one is the tropics spill, the tropics test. And it's also important to recognize that hundreds of thousands of birds and animals were killed by oiling. The best bet for Prince William Sound is 400,000 mers were killed. 
people think that of the order of 30 to 50,000 birds were killed with Torrey Canyon and uh, Amoco Cadiz. So there's enormous slaughter when the oil is on the surface. Once the oil is dispersed, it's below the levels of toxic concern in the water, and it's not on the surface where it can oil birds and any animals that might choose to breathe through it. And of course, shoreline cleanup implies enormous human exposure. Those guys were on those beaches for hours. You can imagine the aerosols generated by those hoses. Just, you know, just, ah. Next slide, please. So now to experiment where they, uh, to a spill where they did use dispersants. This is the Sea Empress. Again, I, this is, you can't believe it, right? Probably hundreds of thousands of tankers, you know, tanker trips are finished in uh, Milford Haven. It's, you know, the principal oil port of the west of Britain. It's in Wales, of course. And yet the Sea Empress managed to find a bloody rock. I mean, you know, it's just amazing. And it was close to shore. And you can see the areas that were oiled. You notice that after Amoco Cadiz and Exxon Valdez, the companies had the wit not to put their names in the uh, name of the vessel. So you won't find any uh, names of vessels that look like oil companies anymore. But this was Texaco's oil. Next one, please. And it was close to shore, as you can see. And lots of tugs came along to try to help and didn't work very well, as you can see. It franged itself and it lost quite a bit. But here they tried a really decent dispersant uh, approach, aggressive. They had seven DC-3s that were spraying it, and they used 445 tons of DASIC. Slick gone. I have to say, I've already told you about Corexit, which is a pretty good name, but I think Slick Gone's a bit better as a name. And now that we all know about Harry Potter, I think they should rename it Slick Be Gone, and that would make it even more uh, appropriate for its, its role. Anyway, they think that they about 50% was dispersed, 5% was skimmed, and only four to five percent beached, the rest evaporated. Even though it was that close to shore, right? And the, the Brits had the wit to say, we, we, we're, we're still going to disperse it. It was not dispersing, it's worse. Unfortunately, the US has regulations that suggest you couldn't, you couldn't, even with the best will in the world, you couldn't disperse here. And personally, I hope that someone in charge would say, I'm going to see you in court anyway. I'll see you in court for this too. We will see. Next slide, please. And then we come to the Ickstock blowout. Now this was a, the first of the major blowouts. And of course, people have mainly forgotten about it. It was down in the Mexican part of the Gulf of Mexico, off, the, off Campeche. In this case, it, it wasn't very deep, but it still took them 295 days to fix it. I mean, it was just spewing oil for a very long time. But they used um, 500 sorties of, of uh, dispersant planes to use 2.3 million gallons for Corexit. And they think that only 7% of this oil stranded on shorelines. So that was that there was a real persistent use of, uh, dis of dispersant here, and the oil probably mainly was consumed by microbes. Next one, please. Then we come to the Deepwater Horizon tragedy, right? And this was a tragedy. 11 men died in that explosion and fire and three, more than three million barrels of oil were discharged into the ocean. So they did lots of things here. That, that's those photographs, of course, of when the rig was still on the top. It was in 1,500 meters of water. So when it collapsed, when it did all burn sink, there was 1,500 meters of pipe down the bottom, right? It was a higgly, ugly mess. Next one, please. They did seriously use dispersants, one million gallons at the surface. And what's really annoying is that the US EPA tried to minimize it instead of tried to maximize it. If I ruled the world, I'd say, how many planes you got? And they'd say six. And I'd say, well, then make it 12. Let's really get this stuff. But of course, that wasn't what the US EPA chose to do. And that worked fairly effectively. And here's now the subsea thing. This is the other place where dispersants were used. And this is down at the actual uh, source of the spill at the broken wellhead. And they injected with ROVs, they inve injected dispersant into the slick. And uh, the photographs on the right are photographs of the well site. The green dot is where the uh, well was, or it's 1500 meters down. And you can see there's boats there. And at least two of them are drilling 
I say at least, two of them are dr trying to drill interception wells. That to me is just staggering that you can do that, right? I, I find it hard with a piece of wood to get to drill a second hole that intercepts the first. These guys are doing it under 1500 meters of water. Then they're going down a thousand meters in the rock and they're finding, they're hitting another pipe, which is of the order of a foot in diameter. I'm just astounded that they can do this. But be all that as it may, you can see that there's a real issue here. These guys are working in an active oil slick. And so of course there's a worry that they're going to be exposed to VOCs. And so the dispersant was added to try and minimize the exposure to VOCs. I of course like the fact that it was added because it would help the bugs eat it, but that wasn't in the minds of the guys who were doing it, at least not, not near the front of their minds. Next slide. We've recently published a paper showing, uh, and Lynn's the first author, um, that indeed this worked very effectively because the ships, were, the VOCs were being monitored by those vessels that were in that uh, zone around the well. And there's a large amount of data, hundreds of thousands of points um, about what the VOCs were in the air. Most of them are zero. So there's, there's lots of statistical challenges in dealing with the data. But if you only take the ones that are of concern, then clearly as you increase the, as they managed to increase the dispersant injected, they were aiming for 10 gallons a minute, but um, often they couldn't get the 10 gallons a minute. But you can see that the normalized VOC hours drop dramatically as you increase the amount of uh, dispersant injected at the wellhead. And on the right is a, a sort of prediction. The black line is the actual measured data. And there's lots of complications in how you normalize it, but I, it's a nice paper in the Marine Pollution Bulletin. But the red line is what we think would have happened if they hadn't done SSDI. The black is what did happen. And we think the green is what would have happened if they'd done it at the 10 gallons per minute consistently. And it's easy to say, well, they should have tried harder. But the, the difficulties of actually doing 1,500 meters, the dispersant starts on a ship on the surface, right? It's got to get down to 1,500 meters. There's got to be a little remote vehicle down there, actually a big remote vehicle that steers up to the... Uh, broken hell and squirts the dispersant into it. No wonder it was intermittent. You can imagine the challenges. But if they'd done it right from the get-go, you can see there would have been almost no VOCs and the oil would presumably have been much more dispersed than it was. Next one. But the key here, in my opinion, is that picture on the left is one of the worst pictures of an Alabama beach. And you can see there's certainly plenty of nasty oil and it's going to be a bloody nuisance to clean it up and it's going to expose people to it. But compared to Prince William Sound, it's just night and day, right? There, the amount of oil on the shorelines in Prince William Sound is so radically different where dispersants weren't used. Now, of course, you can always haggle and say, well, but it's a much bigger shoreline. Well, actually, it's not. I mean, the Prince William Sound is very fractal, right? The enormous shoreline because it's so wiggly squiggly. But the our best bet is that only 5% of oil beached on the Gulf of Mexico shorelines. Um, next slide, please. So this is really the take home message, right? that where there was no significant dispersant use, Torrey Canyon, Amacoca Diz, Exxon Valdez, of the order of 60% of the oil beached. And we can certainly haggle over those numbers, but that's that's the sort of number that makes sense for us to talk about, because who knows what will happen next time. And those are all fairly close to shore. And there are examples of spills way out to sea where the oil was never seen again. That when, wherever it did show up, it was so dispersed, you know, in the other use of the word, the oil patties and things were so far apart, nobody really noticed. So if it's way offshore, <clears throat> then oil spills uh, tend to disappear. And eventually, of course, the bugs will eat it. May, may take a long time, but eventually they'll eat it. And of course, the oil, bugs will eventually eat the oil when it gets to a shoreline. In Prince William Sound, we think without the fertilizer, its, it's half-life was many, many years. And with the fertilizer, we think its half-life was three to six months. But that's compared to one to two weeks if, you just, if, you, if the microbes uh, gobble it up while it's in uh, suspension in the seawater. So there's a tremendous benefit to having the bugs degrade the oil before it gets to a shoreline. So where there's been a serious dispersant response, Ixtoc, 
Sea Empress, Deepwater Horizon. Again, you could haggle over the numbers, but these are the numbers that are published out there. And I think that is night and day, right? That's such a difference. That's why we should be encouraging dispersants wherever they can be used. Next one, please. So today we can say that we are way behind the eight ball, although I don't really understand that phrase. The dispersants have this awful reputation as being toxic when they're not. And that for that, we can blame the toxicologists who quote numbers entirely out of context. For example, not reminding people that this is the same toxicity as two beers or something, you know, or this is the same as dishing, dishwashing liquid. If we, we could certainly persuade, it would be a very good thing if toxicologists were made to say whether the levels you're talking about, the cause effects, are ever seen in the real world. But today there are enormous dispersant stocks, and now there are even, this, these are Boeing 727s that can fly at 150 knots, which is about as slow as you want to go, and they can, dis, they can there are nice pictures of this on the web, you know, they're, they're essentially full of dispersants and you can spray them and they can get to places at 500 knots. So we can expect that you can get dispersant to almost anywhere within the first day of a spill. <clears throat> and we really ought to be looking at how to make sure that can be done. Right? And I suspect there is research to be done, for example, in nozzle sizes for different sorts of oil, different sea conditions. The key to the dispersant, of course, is that those droplets coming out the back must be big enough that they don't just drift off to the Nether Neverland. They do need to go down and hit the oil, but they need to be small enough that they're not going straight through the oil and going into the seawater where they're essentially useless. They need to stick, you know, they need to hit the oil and stay on the oil. So it's quite a challenge there. I mean, I'm certainly in no position to discuss how and why it's done, but it, it's clearly an issue where there may well be research to be done. And if there is, we ought to be pushing for it to be done. Next one, please. So back to Mr. Churchill, right? Dispersants aren't perfect and applying them effectively remains a challenge, but they are much better than the alternative of oiled shorelines with the enormous human exposure that happens then. And I'll just, I've said this several times, our community does no one any favors by continually harking on the toxicity of dispersants since it's absolutely irrelevant. It's the oil that's the problem and biology will save our bacon if we make the oil in small enough droplets that the microbes can eat it as fast as they would like, rather than having to wait to slowly munch their way through millimeter thick slices. I believe that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Well, I've dumbed you into submission because there's not a single question in the Q&A that I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that <laughs> did yeah. anybody stay on the talk? Yeah, they they, they at least uh, left their computers on if they left the room. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I guess many audience uh, choose to finish uh, your talk, uh, finish listening to your talk, and then put the questions. And you can uh, start to populate the questions if you have any. And great talks, uh, Roger, as always. Yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. And especially, you know, I have to move the slides <laughs> along with it. So I have to force to listen to your talk. That's right. It kept you awake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I, I just repeat, right, my email is available on these slides. You're most welcome to email me. And I'll do my best. And also there's a paper, which again, it's easy to find the Google Scholar. It's in IBB and it's actually next year, but it, it's exactly this talk with uh, all the citations that you need and with links to the videos. The videos are worth, yeah, they're, of course, they're, they're typical videos, right? They're typical YouTube thing. You may even have to listen to a, or watch a, um, a commercial, but to actually see the real issues around these major spills puts it in perspective, right? This is uh, the majority of critics have not seen an oil spill and that's a good thing, but I think it's really important that people do get an idea of just how awful an oil spill is when you don't use dispersants. I see uh, people start to uh, send in the questions. Uh, before yes. you go through the questions, uh, so I just want to mention one thing that um, uh, 
So we are going to cancel the January 2023 webinar and uh, because of the holidays, but we'll resume on uh, February. And um, uh, Dr. Ken Lee will be our guest speaker uh, on the February uh, webinar, and he's going to share his experience on um, OSBO work. So Roger, so- I, There's one so question. Yeah. Uh, Dave Dickens asked, and of course he knows much more about this than me, but his comment is, are, are there, his question is, are there any comments about the Brer incident you'd like to make? Now the Brer is another, uh, this was a North Sea spill, and the ship ended up hard aground on the Shetlands or the Orkneys, I'm sorry, we're not sure without looking which one it was. But the point is it happened in a Force 11, you know, a real essentially hurricane force winds. And it was another comedy of errors, right? The crew left somewhere in the North Sea, because the engine stopped working. And then the Coast Guard said, well, you can't do that, get back on there. So they tried to get people back on the ship, but they couldn't, and it ended up on this rock. And it was in an enormous storm. They did spray dispersants. And there's lots of things that are interesting about this spill. And I, since I have the floor, I will tell you about them. The first is this actually was Gulf Pax C, which is an interesting partially biodegraded oil before it comes out of the ground, the microbes have taken their tithe before the oil was spilled. So it has very few uh, linear alkanes in it, but it's still a very light oil, right? Because the microbes are very selective. They haven't touched the small cyclic alkanes and things. So it's still a very liquid oil, still a nice uh, light, you know, it, it's a medium light crude oil, very fluid. And they did spray dispersant, but it was so rough that everyone thinks that the dispersants were more just to show we were trying hard. But there, the funny thing about this is, right, this, the area is rural. And the one that, to my knowledge, this is the only spill. All oil spills, they always close the fisheries for good reasons. You don't want oil tainted uh, fish. Uh, no one ever finds oil tainted fish, but it's still best, better safe than sorry. So the, they always uh, close fisheries and stop sale of shellfish and fish. But in this case, they condemned a field of turnips because <laughs> so much oil got into the air from the storm that uh, the uh, uh, field of turnips got so much oil on it, they said they were not safe to be fed to the local sheep, which was what the expectation was. And they did have to clean some sheep. So instead of cleaning seabirds with dawn, they did actually have to clean some sheep. But sheep, of course, are a very different kettle of fish. They're absolutely covered with lanolin, their oil wool. So that was another challenge. Um, but the brea then was a very light oil and it dispersant was used but it probably wasn't necessary because it was really horrendous weather. Just amazing storm. Are there any other questions I could ask you? Yeah, so- uh... and David asked me again, I, I think the issue about whether we can change attitudes towards dispersants, I really think the issue comes principally from academia where people don't understand the dose versus the actual toxicity. As I say, I, I feel we've done all sorts of toxic tests, right? With, with, with uh, mycids and with all, has done them with all sorts of beasties. And people are now doing it with corals. Uh, and I wouldn't doubt more than a hundred species have been tested. And of course, toxicologists, they, they, they're serious people. So they always kill things that they eventually find the lethal dose, right? They, they don't stop till they do. But these doses are much higher than are ever seen, except in the really first few inches, first few meters after the dispersion, right? And it's, as I say, it's not that dispersants are wonderful. It's that dispersing oil is so much better than not dispersing it. The whole problem is the oil spill. And again, it's worth, I think, one of the issues with nuclear power is the same, right? With the exception of Fukushima, all the other big ones were people overriding safety kits. And the same is true, you know, the Exxon Valdez should never have been where it hit its rock. The Torrey Canyon should never have found the seven stones. They're well marked. On and on, right? The, the, these spills just shouldn't happen. But if they do, it's the oil that's the problem. And dispersants are not increasing the toxicity in anything other than a really local sense that well, sure, if you're a fish and the slick flows over the top of you, you're safer than if someone was to disperse that oil and you had to swim swim the bejeebas out from it. But that, that's only immediately under the slick. 
And that slick's going to carry on moving. And while it's a slick, it's going to kill birds. It's going to kill, I mean, I could show you pictures of porpoises frolicking in the Gulf of Mexico in oil slicks. I mean, it's just dreadful to see this. It shouldn't be there. The oil should not be on the surface. We can fix that. We know how to stop oil being on the surface. We can spray dispersant on it. So we really need to change the metric and say, it isn't that we, uh, dispersants are bad news. We should be pushing the, reminding people of all the problems of not dispersing the oil. I mean, as I say, that it's easy to find all sorts of faults with democracy, right? There's plenty of, Churchill wasn't being just silly when he had his comments there, right? He wasn't saying that, that democracy was perfect. He was saying that in general, it's better than the alternative. And most of us, of course, today agree. And I think if put properly, most people would agree that dispersants are wonderful. We don't want to be out there, oh good, let's use them today. We, we, in, a, in a harbor, we definitely want to skim the oil, right? We can do it there. But offshore is just a joke. If they pick up the oil, you've got to then take it back to shore. And you can't decant the water. All these issues, they're all just ridiculous. They mean that you're never going to have any significant effect on a significant spill with anything other than dispersants. Even burning, right? You've got to corral the oil. You may be able to do that with herders, which would be fast. But if you've got to do it with booms, it's just the same problem as skimming, except you haven't got to take it back to shore. But you can do it at one or two knots. Oil can spread much faster than that. But planes can fly at 150 knots, right? Planes can beat oil. So planes can spray dispersants. And, that, and we have the kit to do it now. So we should be touting that and reminding people not that dispersants are wonderful and you should be asking for it. It's that dispersants are so much better than not using them. End of sermon. I'm sorry that if I'm prattling on. <laughs> There's another question. I have heard that uh, there is a global shortage of dispersant currently. Do you have any insights on why this may be ha happening? I have no insight. I do know that um, Nalco, who makes Corexit, have had real second, third and fourth thoughts about the just the sheer business risk of making it because of the lawsuits that occur with it. And there are all sorts of uh, suits uh, where people are claiming that dispersants, they were working on shoreline cleanup and that they were exposed to dispersants when they were doing shoreline cleanup. And I have to agree with them that the American legal system may well uh, let that stand, even though it's physically impossible. They may well be at risk for serious, but I've, I, my understanding is they're very large stockpiles and I don't know of any reason why those stockpiles should have been used recently. I haven't heard of them being used. But I, I say that the issue is a serious one and that's why we, rather than just pretending, oh, well, let's not think about it. We need to, I think as a community, we need to decide that if we think dispersants are the best tool, which I do, then we really need to think about how do we ensure they're ready and available and not held up by nonsense. And most of that's going to require education. We're going to need to persuade academia that, yes, these things are toxic. Yes, scotch is toxic. Yes, dawn washing up liquid is toxic. Why are you only afraid of one of those? Right. That's the issue here. And again, the issue about, well, it could be chronic. Everybody knows that oils do not bioaccumulate. Right. As, as a general statement. Hydrocarbons don't bioaccumulate, except in a very few things like muscles. And so we can do muscle watch. But in general, all metabolism can handle it and get rid of it, not destroy it, but it can at least. So chronic effects of oil are intrinsically very minimal anyway. But in the case of spilled oil, its lifetime in the environment is so short, if dispersed, that it, you know, the word chronic can't apply. Right? It can only be acute toxicity. But we, we don't talk about that. We don't, I rarely see pe people putting it in that perspective. And I think that's where we need a serious effort to put it in the perspective of not that they're wonderful, but they're so much better than the alternative. Yeah, we have uh, another question. As you're a great, uh, a great presentation, I always appreciate your sense of humor and the presentation style. Since not all oils are created uh, equal, what would uh, uh, your advice be about threshold on which oils to attack with uh, the dispersion and which not? 
That was generous. Thank you. I would say my I have not tried many oils with this person. I will say when it comes to biodegradation, the phenanthrene is the same in whatever oil it's in. Right. And the bugs say, I'll eat that or no, thank you. That's not for me. My view is that it just takes more effort to disperse. They, what, what dispersants, what they do, right, is they lower the interfacial tension between the oil and the water. Now, in the case of really paraffinic oils, and there are known cases of this, right, the oil it essentially solidifies on the surface. They, we call these waxy crudes. One, one spill off Australia, right, at, at night, it became, they became solid pancakes floating, and in the daytime, with the sun, they became liquid uh, uh, floating patties. That, that may be a, a real challenge, but I don't see that's a reason not to do it. The toxicity is so minimal, the cost is high, but you shouldn't have spilled the bloody oil in the first place. Hard luck, you've got to do it. So we should, we should urge dispersion of all oils until absolutely proven to be a waste of time. Because my experience with in most oils, and this is only in the lab, right, with trivial tests, but most oils, if I just shake harder, or I add a bit more dispersant, I can get a much bigger surface area droplet. You know, I can get smaller droplets, which stay in the water if I try hard enough. So I agree, some oils are much easier to disperse than others. And it's then there's a whole other issue. There's the temperature issue, depending on the alkane concentration. And it's mainly the N-alkanes that are the, the deal. Then there's the, um, the, the weird, properties of different asphaltines, which we don't understand, but which seem to be important for dispersion. And then we have the issue of making mousses, which are sort of the opposite of dispersion, dispersions. That's when there's water in oil and they can become solids as they did in, on the beaches after the Amoco Cadiz. That oil was like putty. And so they would have to put a demulsifier into that, which caused the oil to drop. And perhaps we, you know, again, if, if that's really a problem, then we need to think, perhaps we need to, to consider spraying demulsifiers before we spray them dispersant. As I say, I don't, my, to me, the issue is floating oil is a disaster for birds and animals. Beached oil is a disaster for people. We want to stop floating oil and beached oil. So therefore, the logic in my mind goes, we've got to try really hard to disperse it. And we know most things we know, there, there are oils that are difficult to disperse, really heavy oils, probably the heavy fuel oils in things like the Erica and the Prestige, they may have been a real, they didn't try to disperse them, right? If I ruled the world, I would at least made them try. Well, it's expensive, hard luck, don't spill the bloody stuff, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not sympathetic to the notion, well, that's jolly expensive. That, that's fair enough, right? I'd much rather you tried and we stopped oil short, getting on a shoreline than you saved a bit there and then had to spend a fortune on the shoreline and expose all those people. So I, th I think there's a challenge there and that's one of the things, that's where we should be, be working. But our default should be, we disperse if we possibly can. And the only way we know how to do it is planes and dispersant. And if it takes two doses or three doses, so be it. Great. Um, but I'm not, you know, I have, I only have these very mild, I'm not an argumentative sort of guy. I just have these small thoughts. Of course, I'm just an arrogant uh, old man, but I really think that's how the whole industry ought to respond. We need to say, look, we're really sorry we spilled the oil. Let us fix it as best we can. Don't hobble us by saying, well, but don't use any techniques that work. Just, just employ lots of people, but don't do anything useful, which is the current mantra for response, right? That's just really silly. If you're going to be the in industry, if industry is only being told to do things that don't work, then industry should say, well, bugger off. Yeah, no, we're not going to do. It's silly to even attempt to skim at sea. It's silly to imagine that burning is going to save your bacon for a big spill. It's just silly. And we should stop it. You know, we, should, we shouldn't allow people to say, oh, well, at least they're doing something. No, oh, you're causing all these problems. You're putting all these people at risk. And you shouldn't. Yeah, there are many thanks uh, for your great talk. Yeah, I yeah I really enjoyed it. And one comment: uh, we really have public perception problem. Even in 2022, that somehow the use of this person is an attempt to hide or not clean it up properly. Uh, yeah, I mean that that I think 
And, and there are lots, it's not just me, right? I'm just saying that there are plenty of papers out there that show how rapidly oil degrades when it's in tiny droplets. But, and how slow it is when it's either stuck to a, a net or stuck to a clay ball or stuck to a beach in Prince William Sound, right? It's the same microbes, it's the same oil, but now the bugs can't get at it, so they can't eat it. But yeah, that's the, the this is the ultimate bioremediation is dispersants, right? We are making the oil available for the bugs to eat it. They've got everything they need. Thank you very much. They at least are grateful for the spill. Yeah. But we need, you know, we just need to keep saying that. Otherwise people will carry, oh, what about that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, especially, you know, for young people like me, you know, we need to understand this, uh, uh, the behavior and, yeah. <laughs> Can I, uh, exactly. Ed Owens has asked about comments on the use of dispersant in the near shore. Mm -hmm. And for myself, I think the Baffin Island experiment, but also the one in Long Cove and the tropics, although that's different because that was mangroves. But all of those show that once the oil is dispersed, it doesn't stick to shorelines. So I would still recommend using, I think it's very sad that America has got itself into, uh, oh, we won't use it unless it's at least 10 meters deep or at least three miles offshore or all, the, all those things that they are, they're silly because it's much worse to have that oil on the shot on the beach. So, yeah, it's not a, it's never a good thing to disperse oil compared to not having dispersed, you know, having no oil. But I would say that we we should be pushing back against regulations. That you certainly don't want to spray dispersant on a beach. You want to use different chemicals then, right? And, and there's a Corexit product 9580, which will lift oil off a beach, but not disperse it. And it's just a subtly different mix of the surfactants that still allows the oil to adhere to itself so it forms a slick again, right? The, the nice thing about the surfactant mix in the dispersants is it doesn't encourage the oil droplets to bind back to each other. They tend to stay separate. Whereas Crexit 9580 encourages them to form a slick again. So once it's on the shoreline, we should use those things and probably have to wash it back into the sea and collect it with skimmers. But if it's in the water, on the water, not on the beach, if it's on the water, then we should be dispersing it. And in a sense, those kids with watering cans right at the beginning were on the right. That oil would probably have gone back out with the tide if they got enough detergent into the oil and, you know, and the oil became small. Whereas without that, for sure, the oil is going to stick to their little bit of beach. And those beaches, as I say, if you have any time, it's really worth going to... Uh, it, I, I've winnowed them out for you. So go to my paper that's going to be published in 2023. It's already available. I've, I've listed all the um, YouTube, the best YouTube pictures of Torrey Canyon, of Amacoca Diz. Spend a, a few hours on the total, right? Spend 10 minutes and just see how awful oil spills are when they're on a shoreline. I mean, you saw those pictures of those poor French people, Right, they're lovely little houses and bungalows. You know, you can just imagine your granny living there, right? And this awful oil has shown up and no one's doing, you know, oh, well, we'll pick it up eventually. And, you know, again, they will rush around. You just imagine the stench of it and all these things. That wouldn't, if they'd dispersed it, that wouldn't have happened at all. <sighs> Grumpy. <laughs> Grumpy old man. <laughs> so when just I think how I'm going to be when I get old. I mean, it's... <laughs> We, we have one more question left. We are having challenges with the producers of the present uh, reluctant to continue due to the legal implications. Do you have anything to offer that can help with this issue? I, I'm sorry, no, and I noticed that uh, Tom has also asked that. I mean, that's a real problem, right? And it's a problem because of the litigation, litigious nature of the US. But it's also coupled with the fact yeah, just re just this last year, I had a paper has come out about the health of workers, and it, it correlates their problems with BTEX in the oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Yet chemical analysis showed that all the BTEX dissolved in the seawater as the oil rose to the surface. There never was any BTEX in the oil. Now, these guys are measuring BTEX, I don't doubt it, right? They're getting it from all the all the vehicles around that are driving, you know, that you can measure BTEX anywhere you choose to look, and they make a correlation. But it's a nonsense. Right? We know it can't be true. It can't be anything to do with the oil spill, because we know the BTEX all dissolved as the oil rose to the surface. I mean, you know, there's PNAS papers on this, right? I mean, it's decent science. And there's, 
No, you can't have been exposed to BTEX from the oil on shoreline cleanup. And yet the paper is published, you know, it's all marvelous stuff. And it's funded by the government and it looks authentic and everything, except it's nonsense. I don't doubt that these people claim these effects. As I say, that's the other reason human exposure doesn't have to be causing a biochemical thing for it to cause illness, right? I mean, I don't doubt these people have genuine felt problems, right? They're just not caused by chemicals. They're caused by the worry or, or whatever, or indeed just the sheer hard work of working on a shoreline. But yeah, again, we, we I don't see anybody in the industry working to, to counteract that, right? And to have papers that say, you know, to, to be studying these people and saying, look, we agree, these are the issues. Here's the issues of a comparative uh, population who've never exposed to oil spill. And yes, it appears to be higher or no, it's no higher. But now when it comes to chemistry, it can't be this because we know there's no, you know, we can begin to, to make progress. We shouldn't be trying to obfuscate and hide it, but we should be revealing what we really know, right? Which is that the toxicity dispersants we know is not an issue because we've measured it, right? We know it's not a problem, but yet, lawsuits are carrying on and experts can be found who will disagree with me and perhaps they've got papers that are different in which case we can have a scientific debate so i think the issue is these companies are worried about litigation and i think that's at least partially the industry's fault for not having a robust scientific approach to uh, dispatching some of these nonsensical statements but I have no way of persuading, you know, Nalco to want to restart. I, I can imagine their business guys say, stop it. It's tremendous risk for no profit. I mean, that's the other problem with dispersants as a business, right? You buy them and hopefully you never, never need them. So you make them and sell them once, but then you don't sell them again for heaven knows how long. Um, it's not a good business to be in. And yet we see people wasting their time, quote, de developing new dispersants with all sorts of crackpot things in them. And, and it's funded, right? Because the industry isn't saying, oh, stop it. There's no possibility of that being a useful product. Stop it. Do something useful about this person. There's lots of oil research to do. Don't make it out of cactus juice, out of shrimp parts or you know, stop it. We can't store those things. We can't make them and keep them and, and use them in N years. And we can't make a million gallons of it. And that's what we need. So stop it. But we, you know, we don't, we just meekly sit there and say, oh, look at that, isn't that silly? But we don't actively work to stop it and, and to direct it to where it would be useful. You can see, I'm a really, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have another career as a preacher, I really am. Uh, <laughs> in another decade, I'll start on that. <laughs> I'm sorry if I've annoyed anybody, but um, I hope I made you think. Uh, we have uh, one last question. Are you aware of any spills where dispersants were used without authorization? And if so, what were legal ramifications? No, I have no idea. No. I do know that there's a lot of issue. I, I do know that the oil industry itself. So, I mean, I know the embassy where I used to work, right? That um, all countries have some sort of regulation and have allowed some sort of plans that include using dispersants. So every so often we get samples of the dispersant back to test that it's still uh, you know, use, you know, we, we have there's no reason to believe it shouldn't still be just fine after 10 years or, or whatever, but we retest it to make sure that it is, right? I don't know of any, anywhere where you could get dispersant um, sort of off the, off the it, it's bloody expensive, right? It, it's, uh, I, I did a quick calculation. It's of the order of uh, $20 a liter. So it's not the sort of thing you, you buy and think, oh, I'll have some fun with this. Um, I, I said, I'm just urging you know, myself, I, if Exxon had a spill and some guy said, you can't use them here, I would urge Exxon to say, well, I don't care what that guy says, you should do it because it's gonna be much worse if you don't. And for sure you're gonna be in court anyway, right? There's just no possibility of having an oil spill and everybody saying, well, I'm glad that's over. There's bound to be litigation, whatever happens. So that's where I would, uh, but I don't know of any cases where anyone's had the bravery to do it. Yeah. Um, we don't have any questions, only a comment from Tom Kubo. Global dispersing stockpiles are in place. Industry continues to try, try to address the issue of correctly manufacture and availability, uh, but it's a, a challenge. Mm. 
Yeah, and uh, I just add to that. I mean, I did show you that plane. I would say that the industry, at least part of the industry, has really worked hard to make sure there are the stockpiles and the kit to do it. And that's wonderful. What, the one thing they haven't done is do the public relations. And I think the first people to address is the academic community. The people who, who've done the measurement say, wow, I see an effect on my coral at, uh, you know, four parts per million. This is their terrible stuff. Well, that, that's fine. We need to go to those people and say, look, what's the chances you, your coral will ever see four parts per million? Because we, after all, we can do the, these are simple sums, right? We know how much this person, we know the volume, even if it was well mixed and everyone got it, or, if, you know, we can address these issues. But instead, we don't. We allow the toxicologist just to use the words toxic and some number, and everyone says, whoa, that doesn't sound like much, must be dreadful. Uh, and, and without someone going around afterwards or someone you know, collecting this data and saying, look, these are all true. We're not arguing about the truth of the data. We're asking about its relevance to a real spill. As I said, we, you know, the, the volumes of Scott drunk, you know, are gazillions of LD50s, right? But so what? We, very few people die of Scotch toxicity mainly because the people who get their hard up are drinking much cheaper alcohol, right? I mean, but it, it's not an issue if you understand it, right? I don't, that's the problem. We haven't gone to the effort to get people to understand what the toxicology numbers mean. We've allowed people like the Southwoods to say, oh, that rare hermit crab still isn't here. I, it's not a good thing. I'm not saying, well, so who gives a hoot? I'm saying, yeah, that's very bad that that hermit crab is not here anymore. It's not a good thing. In any sense, is it a good thing? But that's the whole point. We never should let the oil get to the shoreline to cause the problem. The problem wasn't caused by the whatever chemicals you use. The problem was caused by the oil. We shouldn't let the oil get to a shoreline. And certainly we should, first of all, make sure the ships are run by people who can read the charts, right? I mean, you know the guys who were driving the, the let us say, the, um, uh, uh, the one that went aground off uh, the coast of Wales, I bet that guy wasn't a beginner. I mean, I can look it up, but uh, I bet he'd done lots of trips, right? And yet he still managed to find a rock. I do the same thing, right? I mean, I cut my grass every so often. I find a rock that wasn't there before or whatever. I think I'm being careful. So we need people to be more careful so we don't get these problems. But the real problem remains that it's oil. Once the oil's in the sea, it's too late to, to weep that it never should have happened because that's for later, right? It has happened. And we shouldn't allow people to stop us using the best cleanup techniques because they're worried about things that are irrelevant. And yep. well, I've said that now 10 times, so I, I really will stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you know we need to keep uh, educating people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, we don't have any questions. And thanks again, Roger, for taking the time to uh, give us the talk. I really uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay.